I'm Dr. Wolf, I'm a forensic pathologist, and today I'm gonna to talk to you very briefly about uh, the things that I'm asked about with regards to people who want to go into forensics and they wanna know how they can best prepare. So I, I think that, uh, first of all, you have to be very interested in medicine. And all these books behind me, most of them are medical books. And uh, I've been interested in that for a very long time. Even as a young child, I was interested in reading medical books. You don't have to always uh, be interested in medicine. Some people don't develop that interest until they're in their 20s. Um, or they have some kind of life experience, which causes them to be more interested in medicine. But you have to have that because that's the root of everything. A lot of people uh, sometimes will say, oh, it's autopsies. You know, you, you don't have to know as much about medicine. Well, it's actually quite the contrary. You have to know as much about medicine as possible um, because, you know, obviously you have to understand anatomy. You have to understand physiology. You have to understand pharmacology. So in terms of drug interactions and interpreting toxicologies. And something that surprises people is you actually also have to have a good basis in surgery as well. Not just because of the technique, the technique of dissection, but rather I have to do autopsies on people who have uh, died after surgery or during surgery. And so I have to be able to interpret, um, you know, from a surgical mindset, what has happened in the body and be able to document that. So first and foremost, interest in medicine. And before that, of course, interest in science, because it is a scientific field. There's a lot of branches of forensics, uh, not just forensic pathology, but we're talking about, you know, forensic entomology, forensic anthropology, and then of course, all of the evidence, uh, DNA evidence and trace evidence examinations. And there's basically forensic everything. If you've seen an episode of Forensic Files or a season of Forensic Files, you know that uh, there's basically a forensic branch of everything, including like, you know, document and handwriting and things like that. So science, medicine, but then there are other things you need to be able to do. One is you have to be able to communicate well, both written and speaking. Why is that? Because with an autopsy report, you are creating a legal document. Um, and that document has to convey exactly what you saw during the case. Uh, and so it is, it is a, a written narrative of the body and all your findings. So you, you have to be good at structuring uh, reports and being able to, um, you know, verbalize uh, in terms of what you're putting in the report, what you're seeing. So you're translating it. You have to be able to do that. Uh, and you have to be able to do it in a way that both, uh, that can be understood both by professionals so by other medical professionals, uh, but also by lawyers who tend to look at these cases and also by family members because a family member will receive an autopsy report and they, you know, there's a lot of technical jargon there, but you have to be able to communicate that. If you don't communicate it in the report, you have to be prepared to answer questions about that report from family members or other professionals that inquire. So... I personally will write a note at the end of my report, uh, most of my reports, uh, explaining my findings so that it's easier for um, the, a family, for instance, to understand what happened to their loved one. So written communication and verbal communication is very important because with verbal communication, you have to understand that uh, it's not just about like me standing here making YouTube videos talking about forensics, but rather... Verbal communication is extremely important because you're interfacing with a lot of different people when you're doing forensics. You're interfacing with police, you're interfacing with lawyers, uh, you're interfacing with other medical professionals, um, uh, you know, deputy coroners or medical legal death investigators during the case. You have to be able to communicate your results. But then beyond that, you have to understand that a lot of cases go to court. And by a lot, I mean, it is a small proportion of the total, but when you go to court, you have to be able to convey your findings to a jury, to the lawyers, to the judge. So um, we're told that we should be able to explain things at about a ninth grade level, uh, not because juries are considered you know, not competent uh, uh, beyond that level, but that you have to understand that the jury comes from the community. And in the community, there are many people who have not had a science class after ninth grade of high school, and they need to uh, understand the basis of what has happened, okay? 
So verbal communication is very important. Uh, and if you can't verbally communicate, then you need to work on it because that is a big part of uh, conveying the findings. Then there are other intangibles, uh, things like, do you have a strong stomach? Because if you do not have a strong stomach, it is not a good job for you. Now, some people can develop that, you know, they can become a little bit desensitized and uh, if they are exposed. But, you know, I pretty much have always had a strong stomach. Things didn't make me sick. Gore does not make me sick. So it really didn't bother me at all uh, getting into that. But it is something you have to think about. And the only way for you to know is to actually be present with bodies, to actually see an autopsy or to see a mortician work, um, to be in the healthcare field and to understand and see very sick patients. So uh, strong stomach because the smells and the sights are, you know, as bad as it gets. So uh, everything you could imagine from, from body fluids and, and organs and tissues and blood and injuries, you have to be able to process that without snapping, okay? And, um, you know, sense of smell, uh, some people have a very strong sense of smell and they do just fine. I do not have a great sense of smell, which has been helpful for, for me in cases that, um, you know, like decomposition, that smell really bad. Uh, and other times there are decedents who, um, they're not decomposed, but they smell really bad because of the environment that they were in. Uh, and that could not necessarily uh, refer just to hygiene, but that could also refer to the fact that somebody might be burned to a crisp and that smoke char smell is very strong. So you have to think about that. Um, and these, you know, these are the basic things, but then also you have to kind of be able to detach from a case. So these cases are, uh, are people, they were people and some of them are quite horrible and some of them are visually very disturbing. Some of them are disturbing uh, just when you know what the scenario is. And, and what I'm saying is, is that, you know, you have murders, you have uh, cases involving children, you have cases involving very tragic accidents, and you have to be able to work in an unbiased fashion, in a, uh, in a fashion that is not very emotional. Now, that doesn't mean you can't reflect later on the case and, and be emotional about it, but during the case, you have to be a scientist, you have to be unbiased, and you have to be able to collect the information from the autopsy, from the body, without uh, invoking your own biases. And now that is something that some people have inherent and some people have to be trained for. So you have to think about, can I deal with some of these things in an unbiased manner? And some people I think automatically discount it and they say, no, I, I can't do this. There's no possible way. But then you get in there and you think about it from a scientific perspective. You think, uh, that what you are doing is you are collecting information that will allow you to arrive at a conclusion that will give closure to the family uh, or in the case of a legal case, will some kind of legal closure. So I look at it in that way. And that's the way that I am able to do these cases and uh, remain unbiased because I know that I am providing answers for someone who has lost someone. Okay, so those are the basics of can you do forensics? You need to go through, listen to the things I've said, and ask yourself, do you think you can do that? And uh, if the answer is I'm not sure, then you need to expose yourself to the situations, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, observing an autopsy or just getting interested in medicine and maybe volunteering at a clinic and and seeing if anything uh, bothers you or you think you can handle it. Most people have a pretty good sense in their gut if they could handle it. But that is the uh, basis of this video. And if you have any questions, please uh, leave a question uh, in the comments. And if this is the first time you're seeing me, please consider uh, subscribing to the channel because we're gonna be talking a lot about forensics here. We're gonna be updating a lot more frequently. And I also have a podcast called Knife After Death. You can get it on, um, iTunes, Google, Spotify, and I'm going to be expanding it to some other platforms. And I'm hoping to do a video component of that podcast here on YouTube so that if you don't want to subscribe via your phone, you don't have to. Okay. Uh, well, again, if you have any questions, let me know.